everybody. Welcome. I'm Daniel G. Garza, and this is another episode of Put It Together Conversations. Thank you for joining us. Happy New Year. This is a five o'clock episode on January 2nd, 2021, and uh, I'm happy to be back for another year. Thank you so much for joining us. You know, for those of you watching, come February will be uh, nine years uh, with Put It Together uh, podcast, so we'll be celebrating some really cool stuff. Um, my producer, Mr. Kevin Moyers, will be one of the guests uh, on the, will be the guest on the 300th episode. So stay tuned for that. If you're not following us already on all of the social media pages and um, all of the audio sites where you can find your podcast, make sure you follow us so you can catch up and uh, listen to us every week. Remember, we have two shows every Saturday, noon and 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time with a different guest on every episode. So check those out. This week, I'm... Uh, I say I, I know I say this every week, but every week I'm excited because all of the guests mean something to me. And, um, today's guest is actor Evan King, and let me give you a little bit of bio on him. Evan King is an American actor, comedian who can currently be seen in the award-winning Nigerian comedy hit American Driver, which I've seen, which won Best Comedy at the People's Film Festival in 2017, currently on Amazon Prime Video. So go check it out if you have Prime. Evan has been acting in film and TV and commercials for over 10 years. In 2013, uh, Evan appeared in the Gulf Web Comedy Series 4, which he promoted in characters with the cast of CBS Great Day Houston in 2013. Evan had a co-star role in the romantic drama Brotherly Love, which played in LA cinemas as well as Amazon Prime in 2018. Yeah. If it's still there, I haven't seen it, I'll go check that one out. Evan has also performed in numerous live comedy and theater shows, such as hosting Visible Change, Changes 35th anniversary show in 2013 and open for musicians Paul Wall and Lil Flip uh, performing music, uh, comedy and music. Next, uh, he's, what is it, 90s DJ mock mockumentary podcast video comedy series DJ Freak Juice 90s for Life will be launched in December with a new music video for it in 2021. And uh, welcome to the show, Mr. Evan King. How are you doing, sir? Doing great. Happy New Year. Good to see you, man. Happy New Year to you. Um, for everybody, uh, the story, Mr. Evan King and I um, met in Houston when I lived in Houston. Mm -hmm. And I was, uh, uh, I was, I'm happy that I got to do his, the trailer for, for one of his uh, projects. And um, uh, I, I played the, uh, I guess the, the pizza guy, the assistant pizza guy. Yeah, you were you were the cool waiter. Uh, you were the you were the waiter. That was that was the first movie I got to direct. It was a little short I did, and I'm so you were awesome in it, man. Uh, we filmed that at, at Russo's New York Pizzeria. So there's a free plug for Anthony Russo. And uh, one of my favorite shots is you trying to high five Anthony Russo, and he ignores you. <laughs> uh, yeah, you were great, man. <laughs> that was fun. Plus, uh, I have to remember. I, I remember that the place had really good pizza too. So. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not a lie. It's the best New York pizza in Houston, Texas. So, so not, not New York, but Houston, Texas. So. <laughs> uh, so we go back to Houston, which is really cool because. Uh, Houston, Texas. So. Sorry, let me turn that down. One of, one of the. Uh, oh. shut up, shut up. One of the coolest. And one of the things that people don't know is that Houston has a pretty big um, film uh, community and there's a lot of stuff that gets done. So I've been to Texas. Yeah, a lot, there's a lot of talent here from music to wrestling to, you know, great actors like, you know, and had you been acting long before I met you? Because I thought you were great. You know, I, 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 well, like many people, like I did high school. Uh, yeah. And uh, I always tell people like I was a I was an alcoholic and drug addict. So some of my best acting was trying to pretend that I was not an alcoholic or drug addict. So I right. guess I've been acting for a long, long time. Uh, but, you know. Yeah life uh, but officially i started uh in fact january december 1st sorry december 1st was my 15th anniversary of being on tv um i started oh, congratulations cool. thank you i started yeah. as a, a host a co-host at houston media source then houston so i was i had i was co-host on one of the shows Sona Festival. And oh, then, you, you did your time at HMS? I think we've all, I think everybody has done their time at HMS, public access. Yeah. yeah. Uh, those it's are, wild, those, man. They are not from Houston, Texas, uh, which my, my, one of my best friends, Roger Palomino, uh, is a uh, station manager there. At, he's there now. Uh, 
But yeah, I think if you're not from Houston, if you don't know Houston, many, many of the actors in Houston and performers, um, and I was doing advocacy work then, have yeah. stepped foot at Houston Media Source and done some kind of program or something. So it's really cool. Yeah, it's, it's good training. I interned there, you can say, for about a year one time for the show Alternative Scream. And that was, it was interesting. I learned a lot. You know, you learn a lot about production. And I think that's the best way to learn about acting or film or TV is just to really do it. Yeah. You know, the class is sort of like a good practice. And, and I think the best way is just to go on a set and experience it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I remember um, George Iniguez and Bobby Valderas, who were co-hosts on the show with uh, uh, Tony Festival, we were, it was just the three of us. And sometimes you had to go and flip a button uh, for cameras or something. Yeah. I got to hold a camera. I learned to be a camera guy and check sound and be in the control room or, and then you had to run back and sit down in the chair and keep talking. So, but for, for anybody out there, and I guess we, this is not the part of the show where we would give advice or, or any, but if you live in a, in a town or in a city that has a cable access show and you have an opportunity to go and help out or volunteer or, or be an intern, do it. That is, I learned a lot there. I learned a lot in Houston. So, uh, yeah, it's a learning experience. I think you learn wherever you go, man. Uh, how is life in California? I miss California. I haven't been in about four years. Um, it's it, it, it's still expensive, uh, but that yes. hasn't changed. <laughs> We're good. Well, you know, California is California. In between an earthquake and a fire. Uh, we're, I, I feel like the rest of the country is trying to push us away. Uh, set it as a fire. No, no, we love you guys. Stay, please. <laughs> <laughs> but everything's good. I'm, 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 I miss, uh, I miss Texas for the food. I miss Houston for the variety of food. So we do have great tacos. Do you guys have a Torchy's tacos out there? No. Uh, well, Danny Trejo has his own taco place out there. It was really good. I had it out there. So. Yeah. Well, Danny Trejo. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I, I still miss good Houston. Like you say, yeah. If anybody in Houston, there's the Laredo's Tacos out on yeah. uh, Washington. Is that a Washington? I think? Taco trucks, all that, yeah. And uh, Laredo's Tacos on Washington, where I used to go all the time. Oh, yeah. Okay, the subject, I haven't had dinner yet. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> I want to tease you, man. So good to have you on the show. Um, uh, but again, we were talking about, yes, so I got to work with Evan um, on a project and then. We kind of lost track of each other for a long time and then here we are back again so it's awesome thank you sir oh thank you man i'm happy to be here and that's what's so cool about social media there are good things about it and some bad things maybe but is that you get to keep track of people so it's kind of pointless now to go to your high school reunions because they're on facebook you know <laughs> yeah you know someone had a baby and if you walk in they're gonna get angry at you it's like oh you got married it's like didn't you know i got married i'm like i, I didn't know i don't you know, I have a life. I look at other things, you know, but uh, no, man, I'm, I'm, I've always kept up with you and I'm proud of you and uh, congratulations on nine years of this show. That's, that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. We're, uh, I'm excited. I'm excited. Um, yeah. But you guys will, will get a notice and you'll, because there'll be an announcement for y'all to join us for the 300th episode and uh, with Mr. Uh, Kevin Moyer. So he'll be on the show. Just keep an eye on that. Uh, but this is about you. The episode is about Mr. Evan King. So um, Evan King, Tell us how you put it together. Put it together. Uh, honestly, are we ever together? I think putting it together is realizing that we're all broken. And every day I just start off almost like somebody else, which is good for acting in a way. I think you have a base and then you have to be open to changing. Um, and I, I guess I learned a long time ago after annoying my parents because I would recite the movie Ghostbusters word for word and they thought it was cute at first. And you know, and then I would do it at like 3 a.m. And then they finally said, you know, we'll take you to acting classes if you just go to sleep and stop talking about Ghostbusters. And, uh, that's when I started like learning how to act for the camera when I was eight years old with uh, with Gary Chasen. And that, that was good training. I never forgot it. You know, I wish I'd stayed with it during that period. But I, you know, I kept doing high school plays, stage and and it took a long time for me to get back to doing film about 15 years now to do like productions like you know video and film. And, but I, I think everything you experience like through your life, you use. You know, whether it's for like your work or, or just your conversations with people, you know, we, we, we were spon we're sponges, really, you know. Um, when you when you were when you were because you talk about reciting and I think a lot of us, I, I used to like annoy my parents with like singing songs from solid. Yeah. Gold. This, is, this shows my age, but 
um, were you a hyper kid? Were you like, like I'm hyper now you, you and I haven't had my coffee yet. So yeah, okay. no, I mean, if I'm like this now, yeah, no, I mean, I was, I could not sit still. I was one of those kids that I just had to always be moving and uh, I had to learn Well, when I first started doing film, this was a problem. I remember one of my first big short films, Tomboys, I, I had an audition and they, they liked me and I got the part, but I remember they came up to me and said, can you just stand still for a few seconds? Just for a few seconds, you know? So you, you learn to sort of like calm down a little bit and how to like, how to sort of like, you know, replicate real people because real people don't move around all the time. So you just, you just yeah. gotta like portray, re, you know, reality. And I guess my, my follow-up question to that is like, I was a, I was a talkative child. I, I, I remember report cards like, Dan is a great student, works well with others, talks too much, which ha, now Ms. Martinez, look at me, look where it got me. Um, but, but she would have her on the show, right? Like if she wanted to be on your show. Dude, if I could go back to Dallas and have all my grade school teachers back that said that I talked, there was only one teacher, uh, Ms. Torres, I think it was Torres or Ferrer, one of the fourth grade teacher who was like, he's going to do things. He's going to, he's going to do things. But, but I knew as a child, like as a kid, I knew that I talked too much. I just didn't know where to put my words. Like, were you aware that you were hyper? I guess it's always been a question for hyper kids. Where, did you know you were hyper or? Did that, no, that, and no, I, I think. Sense? No, I don't think I did until they would tell me to settle down and stop eating chocolate, you know, and <laughs> you, you, would, you would wonder what's wrong with me. It's just chocolate, you know, and I think the cartoons at the times in the late 80s and early 90s, like Animaniacs or even like, uh, you know, Ninja Turtles, like all the cartoons back then were, were hyper. Yeah. So you as a kid, you're watching these like, you know, crazy bonkers cartoons and you want to imitate it, you know. So I sort of I felt like I was a cartoon, really. And, and I think that's a good way to, to live life because sometimes life gets so depressing and so morose that you have to, it's called escapism. And that's what attracted me to this business was to provide escapism for people. That's pretty interesting. Cause um, like the, getting into show business and or entertainment wasn't so much a, for like, a, for a lot of us, sometimes we think of, oh, I wanna be famous or I wanna go to yeah. Hollywood. For you, it was more about escaping the things around you. Well, yeah, in a way, art is like therapy. You know, you have people that will paint paintings to get over a divorce or they had a bad day and they paint. And that's kind of what acting is for me. It is therapeutic, but also like you're providing people, if you do your job well, and sometimes they like your stuff, sometimes they don't, you're giving people a break from your day, you know, and from their day. So that can be on stage, that can be music, you know, because when you're listening to a good song, you're not thinking about all the bad things that happen, hopefully. You know, hopefully it's, it's like everything goes on pause and you go to this other place. That's pretty interesting because I don't think a lot of us, like, well, that's interesting because this is one reason that I do these interviews because it allows me yeah. to step out of me for a while and not, not be so focused on myself and focus on somebody else for a little bit. Really interesting. Uh, let me remind you, ready for everybody watching you, this is Putting Together Conversations. Uh, thank you for joining me today. My guest is uh, actor and comedian Evan King, and we're talking about his life and entertainment. I'm your host, Daniel Chigarza. Um, so once you start getting, um, again, because we talked a little bit in the beginning, Houston does have a big entertainment community. People don't know that, people are not aware of that. But it does. Like most most cities outside of LA and New York and Chicago, I think do. You know, everybody has a special thing about their own city. and. And this place is beautiful. There's so much talent here. I mean, that's how I got to meet you. And, uh, you know, I've been blessed to work with such of the, like, interesting, giving, talented people in my life just in Houston. And and I, I think hopefully, you know, with the internet now, with Zoom and, you know, a lot of bad things happened last year, but also we're able to take this format and you can reach out to the world and show people what your city has. You know, that, that's what, one of the benefits of this format. So that gave me a good segue. I don't think I've ever asked anybody else this question. If um, if we were talking about the best parts of Evan King, what would you what would you tell them? Oh, the best parts. Oh well. <laughs> yeah, uh, the best parts. 
I, I, I'm very stubborn, which can be a good and bad thing. I never give up. Uh, so like all the failures I've had, they've taught me something. And, uh, you know, whether it's a performance or a movie or a personal thing, I learned from it. So I guess just, I, I don't know, if that's a strength or, or, or a curse. I just learned from failure. What have been some of the best lessons you've learned from your stubbornness or your failures? Uh, you know, when I started doing stand-up, like most people, I have, no, I have not done stand-up for eight years, really, because I love acting more, but I also miss live audiences. Um, when I first started doing it, the first two years, I was awful. And interestingly awful in the sense that I didn't understand what the work took. I thought I could just get up there and riff like I did in high school. Like, I made my high school friends laugh and I would do weird stuff. Like, I had this guy from, who's my friend from Japan, play my father. And people thought he was my father. We would sing happy together together. And I got the most laughs. So I'd have people put me in a sack and throw me on stage and I would get out. And I thought I could just improv everything. <laughs> and, and it was, I, I, one time I had an inflatable dolphin and I sort of, you know, made love to it on stage, you know, with clothes on. Yeah, it was weird, weird stuff. And one comedian, Larry Kachimber, he never lets that go. He will always bring that up no matter what happens. But I wanted to be interesting, but I forgot the whole format is a lot like music. It's like jazz, you know, you have to be able to write. And, and once I learned what makes things funny is the writing and the work you put in before you go on stage, people started to laugh. And then I started to get asked to do it more in different places. And, and then people respected that time on stage, whether it was good or bad. They saw that I wasn't just there, you know, for, it was like there was work put into it. Like when you go see a musician, he's worked on that song. He's singing the same lyrics over and over, but he's he's singing his heart out or, you know, and, and that's what comedy is. It's music, but with laughs, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm with you on that. I, I, I went, I've been doing comedy for a couple of years and um, I had to learn that my regular BS with people was yeah. funny but it wasn't stage funny and I had to start tweaking some of it. Plus I have a, a partner that keeps me on my toes when it comes to like, like that's not working, that's not working. Um, yeah, you need that. You need that self-reflection uh, and doing comedy, you know, we're some of the most self-deprecating people, you know? And, but I think that can be funny. You know, if, if, you, if you can make fun of yourself, then you can make points and people can laugh and share it. And, um, and we need jokes right now more than anything, man. I hope, I hope people embrace comedy more this year. Uh, you know, I, you know, it's, it's, it's a broken record, but, uh, I think because during the darkest times, that's what helps people, you know? So I hope we, we see more of that, more fantasy. You know, I, 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 um, I love having all my guests and then everybody is, is here for a purpose, but some of the most interesting guests that I've had on the show are people who do comedy, whether it be on stage or in film. Um, uh, there's a lot of, I think, uh, coming back to the word, as, as there's a little bit of an escapism in, yeah. like, let me forget my troubles for a little bit, or let me poke fun at my troubles and make you part of the joke. Uh, does that make sense? It does. It does. It challenges you, you know? And I've had people in my life that have challenged me uh, and they've taught me things by being brutal, you know. Uh, one time I had not done stand up for three years and I went to this party. I hadn't seen this. He was the guy that actually got us the location, Armando Rene. He's an amazing singer. Uh, give a shout out to him. And he got us the location for Anthony Russo's where we filmed, where I met you. I'm, that's, I, he's because how we met. And I had not, he, and he knew me as a comedian. I had not done comedy for four years or whatever. I went to, I hadn't seen him for five and I saw him. And he had a party and there was somebody playing, you know, ukulele and he gets up and he's like, would you do some jokes for me? This is how he talked. He talks like this. I want, I like you. you I've not seen you in a while. Are you funny still? I'm like, well, I'm just here to watch the show. I, I, <laughs> you're going to do some jokes. I'm like, no, I'm not. Yes, you are. So, so then he got up and said, everybody, Evan King's here to do comedy. And the whole room got quiet and they all looked at me and I'm like, and there was this blue drink that must have been mixed with some alcohol. So I drank that and I just started doing jokes and I forgot what they started laughing. But sometimes those situations happen and you you have to embrace it. Yeah. yeah. Um, are there other situations in your life where it was just like the universe just aligned everything for you? 
Well, yeah, you know, because I did stand up, um, I did it at a, uh, there was a rap club called Jamaica Jamaica. And I performed there. And the guy that was hosting the event, uh, Ready Red, he's a DJ rapper. He then, he loved what I did and he wanted to put me in a music video 10 years ago. So I'm in uh, the Bounce Like Lee music video, just dancing for no reason, you know, following him around, just dancing like crazy. And the guy who filmed that, uh, his name is Cedric, uh, and he liked what I did. Five years later, he recommended me to work for this commercial for this truck company. And they never made the commercial, but when I showed up to work for this guy named Bodeo Joe from Nigeria, and he lives here, he, he was sorry that the truck didn't show up and he paid me and we had a long conversation. And he said, you know, I host this award show called the Guillamas and we're going to be, you know, I want to make a movie and I'd like to make a movie with you. And I thought he was just talking, you know, people talk all the time. So then a month later, he sends me this script for American Driver. And then we started to make the movie. And that was all connected to me doing stand up. So. I think that's what some people just, um, let me put this in a positive. I think that's a great example of taking an opportunity and running with that is that you, just, I, I'm a big believer in it's like, don't say no, just, just go for it. Just yeah. you never know where the opportunity, I'm definitely one for like, um, one of my mottos that I live by is if you think I can do it, then I know I can do it. Because sometimes people just see more in us than we, we see ourselves. And obviously that was a perfect example of that. Yeah, it, it was like, I, I just, sometimes I think faith and luck go with this business a lot. And, you know, there's a lot of bad experiences you have. People do lie and manipulate, but this guy, he was, he was honest. He was true to his word. And, and uh, that was such a, like, I had never been given that opportunity before um, to do that. We filmed it in a month in Houston and a lot of the Nigerian actors played themselves, you know, it was sort of like a meta fiction for Nollywood, their industry. And it was a tribute. I think they were trying to translate what Nollywood is to American audiences in an independent format. And uh, Moses Zin Wang wanted to like, he wanted to be diverse and tell, tell a story that he had not told before. You know, cause I don't think he had done much comedy up until then. And, and, and you know, he, that was, I thought he did a great job. So for anybody who doesn't know American Driver, the movie, can you give them a little synopsis of it? Yeah, I, I play a guy named Jack Curry. He's, he's a dreamer and he sort of lives in his own head. And he's a, he lives with his mom, you know, he's 33 years old when we filmed the movie. And he, and uh, she says, you have to get a job or you're out, you know. And so he goes to get a job, doesn't work out. He meets this woman uh, played by Anita Chris named Kate. And he it's love at first sight. You know, he thinks he's charming her, but he's weirding her out. So, and just like in life, another motivational thing can be love, I think. That, that leads us to jobs, leads us to paths we haven't taken before. And so he shows up and gives like one of the worst interviews you would never hire this guy would you hire this guy in real life <laughs> no you would <laughs> the film and i was like i hope i never get him as a driver <laughs> i promise i'm a better driver man but he uh he bombs the interview but then they hire him because i guess no one else showed up but the two guys uh mcpc the comedian and me and and then he starts to drive uh, celebrities from Nigeria around uh, where he becomes their driver. And he does everything you're not supposed to do when you drive celebrities around. And I know that you live in a place full of celebrities and would he be fired on day one, you think? Or? I, I uh, Yeah, I, you know, I, I hire staff for events and yeah. I have my own marketing company, but I, I kept looking at it and like, I was cringing. I, I had fun with it. I loved the movie. It was oh, thank you. It, it was so different from anything anything I'd ever seen. It, it's just the concept was so cool. Oh, thank you. But uh, and, and I say this with, with all love and respect, you played the best weird guys <laughs> ever. Yeah, I'm not going to give it away. I want you guys to go watch it. Um, but first of all, because I didn't know anybody in the movie, like the, all of the actors were foreign, obviously foreign to me, except for you. So it was interesting to, to, to follow the dynamic of the movie. Because sometimes you follow the movie because you know the characters, you know the person, you're like, you've seen them in other films, you're like, oh, I know their persona. But the only person that I could follow was you. And every, every once in a while I was like, oh, it just made me squirm. And I was like, why is he doing that? And then- It's a lot of awkward moments, huh? 
Yeah. Yeah, and then you would somehow you were like a like a oil balloon. Somehow you would squeeze through things. It, it's really interesting. It's really interesting. Uh, what what was your your motivation? What was your focus on the character? I wanted him to be someone like in a way you could say he's an idiot. I'm really good at playing idiots, you know. <laughs> Just ask some of my ex-girlfriends, they'll tell you, oh, he, he can play an idiot, yeah. No. But uh, no, I, I I wanted him to be sort of like Peter Pan, you know, he's a man child, he sort of lives in his own universe. And that's why a lot of the movie, he has these fantasy sequences where at first you think he's about to drag race, you know, do a race car. And and then you realize he's just in his own mind, he's sort of crazy, he's sort of off a little bit, you know, or he has that like really passionate movie kiss with the girl and then it's all a dream, you know? And, and I think, he's a dreamer is what I would say. And I, I sort of played him like he was just naive and he meant well, and he's also willing to learn, you know, cause we wanted the jokes to be funny and inclusive and, and he is, you know, he does scare the people he's driving and offend them, but it's, it comes from an innocent place. He doesn't know any better. And when he meets Jim Ike, who, who plays himself and he's awesome, he, he sort of learns more about the culture. He learns, uh, how to be? I think he learns how to do his job better. Actually, I would say maybe. I don't, I, I don't want to give away the movie, but there's definitely. I mean, you. I did feel like at the end, like I wanted to find out, like what happened to him. I like. I, okay. Like, and I guess that's that's the making of a good movie is that you want to know more about the character. Like you don't want the story to end there. It's like. So what happens now? Like, what, where are you? Oh, cool, cool. You know what I mean? Like, there's movies that you watch, and you're like, it's over. Like, okay, whatever happened to the character? <laughs> but then there's movies you watch, and you're like, as much as, like, as much as the character, and, and I think, I mean, yes, like, I, now that you explain it your way, it, it makes sense. Like, you, he does seem kind of like, like, he's just, waiting for his opportunity. He's looking for his moment and he's taking life as life, which is kind of cool. Um, but yeah, by the end of the movie, he may have a girlfriend. He's got a friend, a new friend. Yeah. He's got a job. So in a way there was, there was a character arc and I think his, his mom respects him more by the end. You can kind of yeah. see that. So I, I can and, do that. So um, yeah. where, but before you answer, before you answer that, it's, uh, we're halfway through the show. Just reminding everybody, you're watching Putting Together Conversations with Daniel G. Garza. I am your host, uh, and my guest today is actor, comedian, and friend, uh, Mr. Evan King. Uh, if you're watching this and you want to join the conversation, please post your comments or questions in the dark side of the thread, and uh, we will. I will let Evan know. Um, we were talking about the arc of the character and where he yeah. went. Um, what is what is your arc in life look like? How how have you grown? You know, I'm gonna be honest, I love that question and I hope I don't have my arc yet because that would mean I'm gonna die soon, right? Like the, the journey's not over, I hope, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yes, no, no, that's not what we mean. So yeah, let's say in this in this part of the trilogy or whatever of, the yeah. movie of your life. I guess it is that the second movie, we're in the middle of our lives, so yeah. Uh, yeah, I feel, I feel better, man. Uh, you know, I, I had, I've changed my diet and I guess I can talk about this, you know, cause it's, a lot of people don't know. Um, I, I'm a vegetarian, I've been a vegetarian for 25 years cause I love animals. And as a kid, it wasn't a religious or, or, or you know, thing. And I don't care if people eat meat in front of me. Um, I just felt weird eating porky pig and foghorn leghorn and daffy duck. I just thought, I didn't want to eat those guys, you know, so I, and my, I, I, everyone in Texas, it's really hard to be a vegetarian in Texas because everyone eats meat and they all had the same joke, by the way. Hey, Evan, you want to eat some dead cow? You're sure. Mm. You know, I'm eating your friends, you know? Um, well, <clears throat> so I, I did not know how to be a good vegetarian. Like most people, I thought, soy burgers and fake foods were the best way to go because they're in the health section they look good so that's how i lived most of my vegetarian life and you know about five years ago it started to cause a lot of health problems and i i realized that it was affecting everything relationships uh, my, my acting my memory uh, and i guess i may be allergic to soy or something but i i learned in the last two years 
to eat real natural foods, whether you're a vegetarian or not, you sort of are what you eat. It's, I know it sounds weird, but you kind of are. So if you eat fake foods, you're fake life. You know? So I guess my arc now would be, I feel better. Uh, I'm mentally better. I, I gained 50 pounds to play a chef in a short film. It hasn't come out yet. And it took me two years to lose it all. Oh, so wow. I, look, I look different in the movie. Yeah. And, and part of why I couldn't lose it is because I was eating fake foods, you know? So, it, you know, it, 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 I think I've, I've learned just to eat better. And, you know, if you're going to eat healthy, you have to do the work. So. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I did that because I post cancer, I, I was continuing yeah. to eat the way that I was eating before and it wasn't helping. And then, uh, probably about a year ago or so that we started like eating, like really cooking at home. And then the lockdown definitely motivated us to cook more. And I- I'm saw, glad you're healthy. I'm, I'm glad you're, you're better. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Um, um, for those of you following the show that don't know, I had anal cancer uh, in 2015. Sorry. But don't worry, it's all behind me now. It was a pain in the ass in the time, but it's all good. Um, I like to sit and ponder about it. Every okay, <laughs> folks, yes, those are my uh, butt jokes. So yes, yes. Uh, They're I good. did those on my first stand-up performance. But- uh, Oh, you did stand-up, man? You did? Yeah, yeah. I, I started uh, uh, with uh, Cool Beans Comedy here in, in California, in LA. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, so I, I was, I'm one of the people that are very fortunate to have worked at the Ice House before it shut down, so that was pretty cool. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, uh, but you know how funny how the conversation brings us all back to comedy. It's all about comedy. Life is funny, folks. Enjoy it. Uh, but yeah, it, it, people don't. I, I, because I do spiritual coaching as well. I, I tell folks that what you put in your in your body and your system is not just what you eat. It's the energy around you. It's the people you hang out with. Yeah. It's the things that you do. It's the words that you use. Um, it all, your body feels all that. And, and um, did you notice, aside from your body changing, your mood, the way you looked at life, et cetera, did that make a big change when you started changing your diet? It did. There was someone that was <clears throat> very close to me that was just, I think you need people in life to be brutally honest with you sometimes. And, and she was brutally honest and said, you have to change your diet or you're not going to live much longer or you're going to be a miserable person. And once I changed it, like it, not, not only did the weight go away forever, it, I just, I, I don't get depressed as much. I, I just feel like a different person. I feel like more like myself than I have in a long time. And, you know, it's, it's, you're right. It's the energy, you know, and I think we can put bad energy in our, in our bodies, also in our minds and, and, and I, I just never would have thought that that would have changed so much. You know, it was yeah. almost like, quit. to be honest, quitting soy and fake foods, it was almost like quitting drugs to a degree. Oh, I, I, yeah, totally. Uh, yeah. There's, and I do this with some of my clients uh, who are trying to make physical changes by changing their diets. And I, one of the things I tell them is, if you look at your food, as a punishment for something you did bad, then it's not going to help you the way you want it. But if you do, if you look at it as a reward for the changes that you're making, then it will it will definitely feed you differently. Because I, I this sound very conceited and it's not not, not at all. But like yeah. people don't believe that I'm 50 years old and I'm not. I didn't mean. I say 35, right? Yes, yes. I, I'm sorry. I meant 35. <laughs> Uh, Hollywood 35. Hollywood 35, Laguna Beach or Houston 50. But, uh, uh, yeah. but I, it, it was that for a long time, I saw my body as a problem. I saw the foods that I ate as a, uh, like, oh man, I have to eat better. But then once I started looking at my food as something that was helping me to stay better and change the energy of the way you take in things, it, it's just, a, it's the same thing as perception. Like when somebody does a constructive criticism, but you take it as a total like spit to your face, it's the way you take the information. It's gonna make a big difference. It's make Absolutely, a difference. you know, and I, I also in this industry with what we do, we have to be able to take criticism from directors or audience, you know, cause not everybody's gonna like what you do. And a lot of times it's about the work, you know, 
like I, I don't know your experience but I've had I've had directors that are very like uh, very sensual it's like a dance to where you're like okay this is like a partnership and I've had some that like to cause what would I say uh, they just want to stress the actors out whether it's intentional or not and they make everything uh, they sort of like unnerve you and then say action you know like you look horrible action you know sort of like it's like is it, are they testing me or they you know so you have to block that out you know because sometimes you will get directors or people you work with that are hard to work with and the audience doesn't care they don't care what happened they care if it's good or not so you have to block that out yeah yeah that, um and life food um yeah ourselves we we the way we talk to ourselves can be that like sometimes we stress ourselves just for no reason whatsoever um, maybe stress is a drug because sometimes stress feels comforting you're right i just thought about that you know yeah no and and, and we, we can go on for hours on that conversation you, 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 don't do not open that lid. I, I will go off. Part two, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, uh, sometimes we're so comfortable in the uncomfortableness that we think that that's where we belong, and we've just been there. And then when things start changing for the better, we start freaking out because now it's unknown, not realizing that we're going in a better direction. So for that, there. That's true. I think a lot of people are afraid of love. They're afraid of success because it's, you're right. It's like a cold shower. It's like, Ooh, what is this? You're getting out of the pool and you're cold. And, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That, but we, we can go on forever on that one. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the movie because you, oh, are, please, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. you are for, if I remember correctly, you're the only white guy in the movie. Uh, am I white? Yeah. Uh, oh I don't know. It may be my screen. I, I, Daniel, this changes everything. Yeah, I, I apologize. I, this is actually an intervention. And I, uh, what am I supposed to do with my life now? Yeah, I. I Can I still I, dance? I, no. Can I still do accent? Can I do accents? No, and uh, <laughs> please do not grab a basketball either. Just like that. I, I tried out for the basketball team, and my friend uh, Sal Watkins will tell you oh, that was pretty good. <laughs> I didn't make the team, but that was good. But I love if basketball. That, if it helps you any, I, I was part of the basketball team in junior high. I was on the court once. I never played, but once. And that was like in the last like 15 minutes of the game, only yeah. because everybody else had gotten hurt. And it was a very surreal moment. They're like, can you, do we need you to play? I was like, I get my uniform dirty. You're like, what the hell? That's not right. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, no, uh, like I said earlier, uh, you know, I, I honestly, this is personal. I never look at that thing. And I know that's not, popular these days I, I try to look at people like I see souls and I love culture and I'm always interested to know more about different cultures which is why I was attracted also to the movie you know because I had never heard of Nollywood before yeah and I think more people should watch Nollywood movies like Moses and Wang who directed it he's got three other movies on Netflix man they're amazing and it it was a learning experience for me and also for them I think what they wanted to do was they wanted to they wanted to be diverse and they wanted to tell a different story. So that was their decision. They, they wanted to, you know, showcase the story about this person that was, you know, I was different, you know. Uh, but I, I, I just love working with people, man. I love working with artists. You know, I, I never, I tried enough to look at that thing, you know, but uh, it, they were so welcoming and so giving and, and they were so nice, you know. And also like when the movie premiered uh, in Nigeria, it, it did really well. And, you know, a lot of people liked it. And I, I, I've gotten a lot of messages from people in Nigeria. There's an artist named Jerry Mickey from Nigeria. It's his birthday today. Happy birthday, Jerry. Uh, he sent me all these pictures, like drawings of me. And at first I was like, oh, he really likes me, you know, but he's, he's just a really talented graphics artist. And uh, I, that to me has been a blessing that people from Nigeria reached out. You know, not everybody likes the movie, but a lot of people did. And they were so loving and giving to the point where uh, I think we're going to do a sequel and I'm going to work with Bodeo Joe on another movie. I, I can't talk about the, the, that one, but um, they're both going to be comedies and, you know, people, I think they're going to do an American driver too. So we'll get to see, like you said, you wanted to know what happened to the guy. So. Nice. Well, and you know, I, I, I think actors as actors, we, we, just, we, we love our craft and we want to be on a set and, and yeah. performing. I mean, for those of you watching, I, I, at least for me, yes, there is a little bit of, a, of an attention-seeking purpose. Like you want to be in front of camera, you want to be able to show your 
your craft. Uh, and my follow-up question to like to point out uh, you you being the because it's okay. Do I stand up? <laughs> Just a bit, and and I mean, and I mean it with all due respect. And, yeah, and, I know. I know. Like, do you did you learn more about you? Did you learn more about uh, the diversity of their culture? Because there was a lot of stuff. Like, there was conversations that you were having, or if you saw the movie in mute, it would be an American movie. Like you would just go, okay, it's just it's just an American movie. Like okay, cool. And then you you turn off the volume because I did that as an experience to myself. Um, I was like, I muted it for a little bit, and I was like, for all intended purposes, because I recognized Houston uh, for yeah. all intended purposes, and maybe that was my personal. Like I'm watching, I watch Houston. I'm like, this could be an all Houston cast making this movie. And like, it makes sense. But then you start, you turn up the volume or I turned up the volume, listened. And I'm like, wow, this is really an international movie that just happens to be set in Houston. So I, I started yeah. wondering, cause we would always make plans for this interview. I'm, I, I'm wondering <clears throat> like, how much did Evan learn about himself filming this? And how much did he learn about a different culture about where where they come from and how they do things and the language or etc. I, I learned a lot. Uh, I also learned a lot from Jim Mike as an actor. He's a terrific actor. He's one of the best, uh, not only in Nigeria but I think you know everywhere. I think more people should see his work. He's in Merry Men one and two. Moses directed the second Merry Men. Uh, you know he he came to play. You know he everyone was amazing. And say the woman I annoy at the airport. Uh, you know I. I I grabbed the hair and I, I use the British accent to, to mock her because she's from England, you know, and um, Jim Mike was very serious when he showed up and that scene at the restaurant was our first scene we filmed together and they let me improv because they wanted to add jokes and stuff and he improved back like he he never missed a beat and it was almost like getting to play basketball with, a, you know, with Michael Jordan, man, it's like you're, you're playing with a pro and I, you know, one, one of a great actress I worked with one time said, work with people that are better than you so you can grow. And that's kind of how I felt working on this movie. He was, he's got experience. What I learned about the culture, uh, you know, in that scene at the end of the movie where I'm eating the soup, uh, I really ate that. It's very hot, very spicy. <laughs> so that was method. But um, I, I would love to visit Nigeria. You know, there are a lot of the people from there that message me on Instagram all the time, want me to come out there. And I would love to, I'd love to go there one day, uh, you know, it's such a blessing. Culture is such a blessing. When I was a kid, I used to always do these things called uh, culture night, which is like a talent show where they would showcase different cultures. And I just have always been attracted to different cultures. I think they're what make the world that diversity and also the sharing of that culture, the res learning the respect of it, you know, that keeps the world glued together. I think, you know, there's no borders, there's no segregation, you know, and, and that, to me is the beauty of why we are all so different. And, and that, that was attractive to the movie, you know, that, that award shows in a real award show, we crashed it. They had no idea what was going on. And yeah, that was, that was one of the most fun things was to stay in character, run in with Jim Ike looking like he was wounded. And then he goes on stage and I come out and no one knew that it was film until it was over. Wow, guerrilla filming right there, folks. So now you, wow. Even at the airport, man, we, I don't, we may or may not have had permission to be there, but it was fine. <laughs> no, it, it happens here in LA too. But uh, I wonder, cause you wonder sometimes like you're watching something like how much of that was like already put together. Like now it makes more sense. Uh, well, the cop, the cop chase, they rented a cop for a day and he wanted to be in the movie. So we, we did the cart, the, the car, cop chase scene three times on the freeway. That was crazy like to do all the driving, to be responsible for acting, not killing the director and the co-star, and then listening to direction. I, I, le I learned how to be a better driver, actor driver. <laughs> because because we did the first scene, you know, I'm driving, he's, he's got the camera behind me. And I say a line, I'm a little nervous because I don't want to crash us. And he just, uh, his only note was do better. So like, oh, so you just learn to suck it up and stay in character. I just stayed in character the whole time. Yeah, I've done driving scenes and it, yeah. it is it get it by like the third shot you're just like okay i got this like i yeah like i, I got yeah um 
because for just a little behind the scenes of this interview and watching the movie, I actually was, was uh, messaging Evan while I was watching the film because there were some points where I was like, wait a minute, like, what about this? Because the first part that got me, the first part was like, you, there's a part of this of the movie where you have to, that, that your passenger tells you to just stop the car so he can go from the front seat to the back seat. Dude, that was real. And those people honking were not happy. That's yeah. what was so intense about this, this project is it was, like you said, a lot of like guerrilla filmmaking, they call it. It was like 70s movie making where you just grab the camera and go wherever you're supposed to go, you know? Well, great job, sir. I think you did an amazing job with that character. No, thank you. Well, I'm so glad that it made you laugh and that, that you liked it. You know, yeah. I, it, 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 it means a lot. So. It, it was, I was inquisitive. I was like, wait a minute. Like, is that what? Uh, but good job for you, sir. So we are at 45 minutes into the show. For those of you watching, this is Put It Together Conversations. I am your host, Daniel Gigasa, with my guest today, actor, comedian, and friend of mine, Mr. Evan King. Uh, this is the uh, part of the show where I ask my guest to offer some words of wisdom to the audience. So, Mr. Evan King, what words of wisdom would you like to share? Words of wisdom. Uh, I'm, you know, if these words of wisdom don't work, uh, you know, you can blame me. But <laughs> we just we just came from a really like uh, hard year, 2020, right? You know, and I know that it's a new year, and I, I does it feel like a new year for you? Yeah, I think so. Spiritually, it does. You know, I know not everyone got to go out and celebrate and that I feel bad for, you know, because I wish everyone could, you know, and I know we're all ready to go. We're waiting to see what happens with the virus, the vaccine, everything. It was such a tough year that, you know, going into 2021 and we're ready to make love to 2021, just like getting out of a bad relationship. You're ready to make love to the next person. But I would suggest that everyone go on a few dates with 2021 first, get to know it a little bit. You know, before you do any foreplay, before you before you sleep with it, before you marry it. So, you know, about June, then you can make love to 2021. That's the things that are going on in my mind right now. But yes, that make that makes total sense. We've been hurt before, man. 2020 was kind of abusive. I got scars, man. But yeah. So I, I love you, 2021, but I have been hurt before. Be gentle. Yes. I think for a lot of people, 2020 started, the first couple of months, we're all like, yeah, we got this. And then it's like, it, it, 2020 left us without, without a note. It never texted us back. <laughs> it, it no, not only, it, I feel like it, it left us for dead, man. It's like, my job's done here, you know. Yeah, 2020 but, definitely. But, but the beautiful thing is, man, we survived it. Uh, to those, it's, it's, it was such a rough year, but like, we're here, you're alive, I'm alive. And that's a gift, I think. Yeah. Um, I, I, I know personally too, uh, there was a lot of people that lost yeah. someone during 2020, if, if not more, but uh, yeah, was, okay. you're, if you're watching this or hearing this, um, you're still here and you, being alive is a commitment to continue going after your your dreams and your goals. So continue to move forward. Don't don't stand still. Uh, and I would also like to add to that. You're right. You know, to all the other artists out there, I know this is a very tough time. You know, because I I believe we were lucky when we were younger because we lived in a time where they said be anything you can be. You know, you know, uh, just do it, Nike. And there's so many limitations now, all these new rules and everything, and there's a lot of insecurity. And I would just hope that to all the young people that are creative, actors, painters, dancers, musicians, don't limit yourself, please. You know, the best thing about this is challenging yourself. Open yourself up to challenges is what I would hope. Yes, yes. And I think I'm coming out of 2020. And I, I, I do take time at the end of the year to... Take a deep breath. It's like, you know, just because it turns at the calendar page doesn't mean that everything just falls off and we start fresh. But wouldn't it be crazy if it was like that? If we were like like a video game, like, okay, we're back, you know. Life. Here we go, new Mario Kart. Um, but it is a time to like look at 20, look at the new year and go, what can I leave behind that it serves me no more purpose in the new year? And Sometimes there is a lot of energy that we just carry out. Again, I, I, my, my spiritual coach hat comes on, but it's, it's, we, there's a lot of energy that we just don't need to carry on. And 
let's 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 move forward. Let's 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 laugh, people. Let's laugh. They're still well, speaking of, uh, may I may I, I know we're almost out of time. May I talk for a second about DJ Freak Juice? Yes, just for a second. Yeah, I, I just want to give a shout out to Rochelle Gomez. She's my co-star. Uh, we did a couple of comedy songs when we performed them in front of the Paul Wall Little Flip Show. And uh, we're going to be releasing music videos soon. So uh, DJ Freak Juice is a fictional DJ from the 90s who's still stuck in the 90s. So I'm, I can't wait. I'm so excited to bring that fictional scripted podcast and show to people. Uh, I just hope it takes you back. So I just wanted to, you know, it has an amazing cast. So Rochelle Gomez, Sabrina Favoriti, Marcus J. Parker was in it. Uh, Johnny Duwan, who is my, my best friend, my co-producer. He plays Freak Juice's agent. So uh, Freak Juice has a disease called retroitis where he actually thinks it's the 90s. He can't help it. So if you see DJ Freak Juice out there, don't cancel him. He doesn't know any better. <laughs> and if you're going to cancel him or me, let me have a show first. <laughs> then you can cancel the show. That is, sounds pretty cool. You, I, I hope you guys will make time to come by back to put it together and oh. it. R Rochelle would love that. She's she's so talented. She, I'll send you some of her work. She's she's an amazing voice, and you know we uh, working with her. It's like working with uh, it's like a comedy team. I, you know, she's so we just the energy I feed off from her. She's great at improv, and she's up for anything. She plays two characters, and uh, we did a stuck at home special. I'll send you the trailer when this is over. The trailer's up online now. And she plays uh, Judy Ring, Freak Juice's girlfriend. And she plays a prostitute, which Freak Juice calls Street Princess, named Blow Pop. Um, I, I, if you're going to be a street princess, I think uh, Blow, Blow Pop? Blow Pop in the show is the inspiration for the movie Pretty Woman. So that's why they're interacting. So. Got it, got it. So that I, I, I think we need a T-shirt that says uh, "Princess Blow Pop" on it. So. <laughs> Prince, well, that that's Freak Juice's favorite Disney princess is a uh, Pretty Woman. So. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it was a Disney movie, and she is a princess from the streets. <laughs> you know what? Uh, as as I am a huge fan of the movie, and that is that is the first time I ever. I've ever heard it from that. Yeah. So with that said, uh, <laughs> a whole new perspective, right? <laughs> I, I'm not. Now I want to watch it tonight. I think I'm going to look it up on. on hey, Prince Richard Gear saved her, man. So <laughs> um, for everybody watching, this has been put together conversations podcast. I am your host, Energy Guys, and my guest today has been actor, comedian, and a friend of mine, Mr. Evan King. Remember, guys, uh, if you are not following us on all the major social media pages, please do so. We're on. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok, Rizzle, uh, Twitch, which we are now starting now, uh, and YouTube. So we're on eight different pages. You you can't miss us. So please go follow us, especially we need a lot of followers on, on YouTube. So go check out those pages. Not only do you find uh, the past episodes of Put It Together Conversations, but you find other shows and some of the comedy stuff, plus all of the lineup on Little Mexican Productions. You can go find the Christian and Daniel shows, which airs um, here on Facebook on Wednesday nights at 7.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. The Cart Devo, which airs on Fridays at 6 p.m. And Put It Together Conversations with two shows on Saturday, noon and 5 p.m. also Pacific Standard Time. So we start. And every once in a while, we sneak in a two o'clock show. So if you're watching this on January 2nd and you missed the episode with my predictions for... 2021 for all the signs. Go back and find it. It's right here on YouTube. It's right here on Facebook. Go check it out. I'll put a link so you can check it, find that. But it is my intuitive predictions for 2021 for the Zodiac signs. So go check that out. Follow the Car Devo on Facebook. Um, where can they find you? And any last words before we go? Oh yeah, you you, you can find me. Uh, I'm at evanking.tv. The show djfreakjuice.com is where we're going to air a lot of the podcasts and videos. Uh, follow me at Evan King Show on all the social media platforms. And uh, speaking of you, uh, do you have a MySpace? Can I follow you on MySpace? You know what? You joke, but I still have my MySpace page. Uh, well, it's still there. They took away all the pictures, but it's still there. So, yeah, yeah. But it'll come back one day. That'd be retro and that'd be I'm all cool. Waiting, I'm waiting to do my glitter pictures. And <laughs> I'm Tom, don't forget me, Tom. I'll be back. Yeah, he's like, 
Yeah, no, he, I hope he's okay. You know, I hope Tom's you know, okay. You know. It's been a while since I talked to Tom. For those of you who are way too young to remember MySpace, it are was, we that old, man? Come on. It was the original <laughs> social page um, where you could, I, I remember trying to find the codes for stuff and putting up glitter. I'm not going to lie. I love the design of MySpace the best because it had the best outlook, you know, the best platform. A, a lot of us started our our social media careers on on MySpace. My first, you know, and, and I get I got to say you'd be in my top five. So Ooh. That, that was the thing for everybody out there. You know, they didn't. <laughs> no one blocked anybody back then. No one canceled anybody. It was you're out of the top five. You know, and that that was the only drama on social media was who was in the top five, who was number one. I, oh my god, I was very selective. Of who my top five were uh but, and you would know if your friend bumped you down a notch you're like what did i do <laughs> uh but when when my very very first video were called one minute with with daniel and i would do just one minute rants um and the first places i would post them were on myspace and then i went over to youtube so i've had my youtube page since 2008 um and it's awesome man yeah but i would post little videos on oh my god you're bringing back memories hi tom if you're watching us we still think about you <laughs> but for everybody who's like who the f is tom tom was like the he was the mark zuckerberg of the 2000s yeah. but a little yeah. bit different so. and so when you logged in when you created your myspace page the first friend you got was Tom and everybody had Tom. Everybody, everybody knew Tom. So yeah. Oh wow. That was that was a little that was a little uh journey down memory lane. Um thank you so much. But for I, I just want to say I, I love you, man, and uh thank you for for having me on. And I, I would love to work with you again in some form. I hope we get to do it again. You know? We we will do it. I I'm sure the universe is gonna uh, we're gonna do it. Something something's gonna come up where you're you're gonna need yep. a little Mexican sidekick and I'll, I'll be there to work with you well i still want to see your movie so when you when you have a watch party <laughs> what, was, what was the name of your movie uh so callejero for everybody that that's that's been following me for a while you know i was in callejero uh it was it was on prime and i it's not there anymore and it was on google for a while but you have to buy it and so i've been trying to send evan the link for like a week now and it doesn't so we're gonna i'm gonna see if i can do a, a uh i'm gonna have you act out the scenes you're in we'll do that <laughs> there, there, I, it's i'm very sad in most of the film I, I'm, very, I'm very passionate um i'm like the jiminy cricket of the movie i'm trying to like put conscious into the main character okay yeah. all right i can dig that i, uh, I like jiminy cricket yeah. but uh, maybe we'll we'll schedule that we'll schedule a viewing party where i can show it to folks and you guys can see it so we'll work on that I'll, i'm going to talk to the director and see what i can do about that Please. i love that man because i'd love to see more of your work and like i said I, I i still remember you were so much fun to work with back in 12 years ago 2009 is when i worked with you and you you, you were ready to improv man you were just you made it fun thank you you know it's it, you I, I don't know about you but like now getting emotional there's onions in the room um I know we're going over it. We're going to go over it for a little bit, but uh, a, a lot of you folks watching or hearing this know that, like I just said earlier, I started my career in television at Houston Media Source in Houston. Um, some of the first movies um, that I worked on, uh, Backroads with Wayne Slatton out there in Houston. Wayne, yeah, yeah. Wayne. Uh, so I did. I was. I played a drunk guy in 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 Backroads and. Uh, then I went on to do some other stuff. I did several student films and a couple of other projects. Uh, Rent a Car was filmed there in Houston uh, with, uh, oh my God, Lemon. I, I just forgot her first name. Um, anyway, uh, with many directors there in Houston. So I, I worked on several projects and those were the beginnings of my career. So um, working with you was one of those highlights where I was just starting. So for people to book me for stuff, I, I, and I had no idea. I thought you were doing it for years. I had no idea. But if anybody wants to find it, it's 12 Minutes to Heaven Fate. It was my first short film that I directed. And uh, yeah, that was a fun day, man. Uh, Brett Simo, who, who filmed that, he, I still work with him, actually. He's, he's, 
he's sort of the glue. He's, he's been like a glue and taught me so much about editing. And, you know, I, I started to edit things I direct because I was inspired by this story I heard about Prince. I had no idea that he would edit his own music. Did you know that? Mm -mm, no. So, you know, I, I never, I'm not an editor. I, I, there's so many things I don't know. But I was like, well, you know, if you create something, someone's got to do the job. And you sort of just learn to do more work. But, you know, Prince would do a lot of his own polishing. You know? That's, yeah, well, you're, you're so talented, man. I'm sure, like, I, I'm, I'm so positive that anything you put your mind to, you can accomplish. So. Oh, thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah, but we're, we're going to work together. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it out to the universe for 2021. I'll, I'll be back. Please. Uh, we'll, we'll work on something for everybody. Even watching, if it's a musical, a musical together or something. You know. a mu oh, no, that would be interesting. That yeah. being a musical. That that. Um, <laughs> I'm ready, man. Why not? Why not? I I, I am taking that uh, singing lessons, so why not? Um, but for everybody watching, uh, before we take you on a further road down memory lane, thank you, Evan, for being on the show, bro. Uh, oh, thank you, brother. Thank you. Really appreciate this. Don't go anywhere. Let me just say goodbye, everybody. For everybody watching, make sure you follow us on all the social media pages. Uh, we want to hear from you. If you want to be on the show, please message me on any of the sites or email me at Daniel G. Garza at littlemexicanproductions.com, L I L M E S I C A N productions.com, and uh, I will get back to you. Or if you know somebody you think should share their put it together story, I would love to hear it and have a conversation with them. For now, I'm Daniel G. Garza, and hey, put it together. <laughs>